Okay, uh, our first speaker is John Robertson. Uh, he's with the Idaho uh, Conservation League's Public uh, Lands Director. He is the Public Lands Director. John has served on the Lemhi Forest Restoration Group, the Payette Forest Coalition, and the Idaho Forest Restoration Partnership. Before moving to Idaho in 2001, he ran a field science uh, program for the Canyonlands Field Institute in Moab and taught forest ecology at the Teton Science School. So, John. Great. Uh, is this working? Turn, all right, this? Don't turn it on. Okay. Ah, it's amazing how it works. Um, well, first of all, thanks for the sponsors, uh, the extent, uh, uh, everyone for, for helping host this, this great conference. I'm glad to see we're, we're continuing a fine tradition of uh, gathering to discuss uh, forest and natural resource management in windowless rooms while it's a beautiful day outside. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, my vision or perspective of what's going on in Idaho with forest restoration issues, and particularly collaboration. How many folks here are currently uh, working on or involved with a collaborative, forest collaborative? Okay. How many folks hope to one day? Okay. And how many folks have but never will again? <laughs> Just wait. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, uh, the group I work for, the Idaho Conservation League, uh, we're a statewide uh, conservation, conservation organization for Idaho, kind of a middle of the road group. Uh, depending on who you talk to, we're either the radical environmental extremists uh, or we're the sellout bastards. So we're kind of in the middle. And depending on who you talk to, they're probably right. Um, but a little bit of version about how we kind of got involved in this um, goes back to the timber wars. I've been with the Idaho Conservation League for about 16 years now. And um, uh, things were pretty, pretty brutal for a while. Uh, we had a uh, salvage logging rider. We had uh, mills in Idaho that were shut down. Uh, and just a, a huge roller coaster of timber wars. And I kind of came in on the tail end of this. Uh, and it was pretty, pretty uh, uh, rough going, I think, for everyone. And then we kind of moved into the Cold War, where um, the Forest Service would put out something, and there'd be lawsuits, appeals, litigation, more paperwork, EISs. And the conservation community got really good at stopping things um, uh, and saying no to things. And someone asked us, well, what do you want? And, like, and that took a little more question there. Um, and the thing what happened is uh, not much was getting done at all. Um, Certainly the big roadless uh, um, incursions and clear cuts and things we were concerned about, concerned about weren't happening, uh, but also the forest restoration projects that uh, just simple watershed improvement projects weren't happening either. Um, these uh, pretty innocuous uh, uh, timber cells in the front country where there are already roads weren't happening either. The, from our perspective, um, things are just kind of shut down on things. Um, and there's this stigma, you know, that persists to today about, you know, what happened and who actually won the, the timber wars. Um, this is the sign that greets you in Salmon, Idaho. You can take your tree-hugging, granola-eating, politically correct, earth-worshipping, Subaru-driving, ponytailed sandals in the winter, wolf-loving butt somewhere else. So when I show up to a collaborative meeting in, in Salmon, that's what the sign that greets me. Uh, and then, you know, kind of goes both ways. Um, there's a lot of distrust out there, you know. Uh, who cut one? This is a sign in, the, in, a, in a bathroom in McCall, um, actually one of the establishments. Um, but basically not a lot was going done. Uh, the bad stuff wasn't happening from our perspective, uh, but the good stuff wasn't happening either. Um, just one analogy, I um, had uh, uh, the Salmon Chalice National Forest put out what I thought was a white hat project to decommission 20 miles of road next to a stream uh, up in, uh, um, outside of Salmon. And the county commissioners got a hold of that, and they called up the senator who called the Forest Service folks, and then that project was dropped. I'm like, that's one of the projects we could have supported. So it was not much was happening. And then we got a call uh, from a woman with the Salmon Valley Stewardship. And this is what Jesse Abrams is talking about in terms of those interesting community-based organizations that are kind of fill a niche or a gap uh, between the community and the agencies. And this is with Gina Knudsen, 
uh, who's now with the Forest Service, but uh, uh, Salmon Valley Stewardship worked with the communities of central Idaho to integrate environmental stewardship into economic and community development activities. So uh, from our perspective, certainly traditional economic development activities didn't really consider long-term effects to the environment. We have a whole host of issues. At the same time, folks uh, from the environmental side, you know, uh, kind of didn't really think that long or hard about how the um, economics, uh, local economics, would be affected by actions and, and, uh, and the social well-being there. So a couple things with Salmon Valley Stewardship, this is from their, their mission statement. Basically, New Way Forward considers human community as part of the natural community, partnering, and builds the region's capacity to build a sustainable economy. Um, and a lot of things we talk about sound good, it's like resiliency. We, it's, we still haven't quite defined what sustainable really means, but everyone involved so far kind of starts nodding their heads. So we have Salmon Valley Stewardship convened this collaborative and invited conservation groups like the Idaho Conservation League to be a member. Um, and so the mission to enhance forest health and local economies uh, through restoration activities, again, pretty generic, but everyone's nodding. Uh, and then we've got a big group there, county government, timber, conservation uh, agencies, and so a bunch of folks at the table. So the first project, we came up with this, was this Hughes Creek hazardous fuel reduction project outside of Gibbonsville. Um, and it was a pretty simple project in this day and age. Um, just about 13,000 acres for prescribed burning, about 3,000 acres of commercial treatment. We talked about doing some road work. It was too controversial, no one had to do anything about it, so it's just what it was. Uh, but we got it done, and what's significant, it was the first project out of that district uh, to not be appealed in over 10 years. So it was a baby step, but it was a significant one. Um, one of the things, of course, you had prescribed fire going on there, but then part of the project, we realized that there's a bunch of, of old dredge spoils down in the creek on private property, um, but part of the surveys they did, uh, that Salmon Valley Stewardships did, showed that the salmon and the steelhead didn't actually have good spawning habitat in there. So, we had some extra material left over from the uh, timber contract. We got Salmon Valley Stewardship, got some horse loggers to actually pull it down in the stream. And uh, the next year, we actually had steelhead spawning in there. Not from that exact spot, but you get the picture. This is a feel-good project that actually addressed some things and it worked across boundaries. We decided to do more. Upper North Fork project. Again, expanding 41,000 acres. I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. Um, that it decommissioned 67 miles of roads. Um, and this is with the support of the county. So we had gone from, I couldn't even get the Forest Service to consider 20 miles, and we've got 67 miles going off in there. Um, it also had a treatment in an inventory roadless area, which was pushing the comfort level for us, but the Forest Service did a great analysis on it, and it made sense. And it was awarded a Joint Chiefs uh, project uh, to partner with treatments on the nearby Lost uh, Trail ski area. Um, so a pretty neat, neat project overall. And now we're working on to the Jesse Creek project, which is in the Salmon uh, Municipal Watershed. So uh, just a little uh, follow-up with that. In 2012, the Mustang Complex fire burned out of the Selway Bitter Wilderness and rolled into the Hughes Creek project area and dropped down to the ground. Was it just the weather that day, was the fuel treatment, hard to say, but that did give the firefighters a chance to backburn and no structures were lost. So a good little shot in the arm there for that. Um, they also, one of the things that Salmon Valley Stewardship did as part of this Lemhi County Forest Restoration Group was look at the restoration economy in the area. So a lot of, a lot of restoration happening there isn't making a difference. And so they found out, did a little study sponsored by the National Forest Foundation over five years, $12 million of restoration work uh, uh, happened through the community. So that was actually, we had 47 jobs annually, 70 jobs in two rural counties, fantastic uh, uh, economy that had been overlooked. The challenge though is that a lot of the workers were coming from Montana because they knew how to bid on stewardship contracts, they had the tools, the equipment, the infrastructure, the staffing, the expertise to do it. And so as a result of that, Salmon Valley Stewardship started doing some local training for contractors on how to actually get in on this. Um, because we want to have the restoration jobs, but even better, 
if we can keep them local too. So that was all happening over here uh, on the salmon side of things. Um, collaboratives kind of have spontaneously generated in several places throughout Idaho. Um, Idaho is very diverse uh, topographically, geographically, but what we're finding is all these collaboratives were born out of conflict. People from the, both the conservation side, the industry side were frustrated that things weren't getting done. And these are pretty common sense things. And so uh, the Idaho Conservation League is involved with uh, over eight different collaboratives now that are, are um, uh, basically in their third or fourth or 10th year now uh, in operations. Um, and one of the things is that we actually have a lot of the state still a functional infrastructure of milling capacity and forest industry. So that's actually a huge advantage uh, uh, when you're trying to figure out what we're gonna do with some of the, the material. Um, so just moving on for some of this stuff, um, with all these folks, and I was attending a couple of them, the, particularly the folks from the individual ranger districts and the uh, actual forests, uh, and actually the regions weren't really talking to each other. And so it was some of the participants going back and forth that would actually uh, uh, bring folks together. So what we did is we uh, went ahead and developed uh, a partnership, basically a big uh, forest restoration partnership to network and to bring folks together in an annual conference. So it's conservation groups, Nature Conservancy, Woody Biomass Utilization Partnership, uh, Society of American Foresters, and basically, basically we figure out you know, how can we support collaboratives? Um, so one thing I just want to point out here, open invitation. Our annual conference is going to be March 20th in Coeur d'Alene uh, in partnership with the Montana Forest Collaboration Network. Um, and we just want to bring more folks together and lessons learned. So open invitation for everyone here. Um, a couple of themes I want to pick up on that we've seen that, that work for folks here. Um, there's a zone of agreement that all of these groups kind of have and that is that if we're all in that zone, we can, we can keep working together. Um, conditions have changed, forests are, are too dense, um, and we need to, to some active management there to move on. Um, we actually, actually have to work on um, uh, uh, basically active management, not just letting it burn, but actually doing some more work there. Um, the roadless rule, the Idaho roadless rule, was actually really helpful in that it focused efforts in the road and front country. We're not fighting the old school battles anymore. Um, timber industry is a huge ally in this. Um, and one of the things I wanted to mention is that the revenue generated from the sale of the wood helps finance the restoration activities, but it can't be the main driver. So there's a bit of a balancing act there. Um, integrated projects, it's not just all about timber. We're looking at other factors as well. We're looking at recreation, we're looking at watersheds, we're looking at fisheries. Um, and then, as Paul mentioned today, warming climate, we've got mega fires going on there. The fire seasons are 60 to 80 days longer, uh, and over half the area uh, burned in western wildfires, uh, folks think is attributable, attributable to climate change. Um, so a couple of things. Here's kind of a summarizing. When we have all these folks together for our annual conferences, here's the themes we see. We see. One, are the right folks in the room? And again, another windowless room. Um, but bringing diversity, maintaining diversity is really important. Um, caring and feeding for your collaborative. Uh, also, it takes sometimes a cup of coffee. And then another cup of coffee. And then you have the afternoon break, you have a cup of coffee. These collaboratives, I have to say, if there's any other way to do it, you would. Uh, if there's any other way, you just run screaming from the room. But the problem is, it's our, best, it's our best case scenario. Getting out in the field, having a shared basis of knowledge is key. Um, we can look at this and say, oh, there's, there's, some, there's some work to do here. Starting at the homes and moved outward has given groups like the Idaho Conservation League a lot of, of, of comfort saying, yeah, we know uh, uh, where the homes are. We don't know where the fires are. So let's start here. Keeping the big trees. Um, has anyone here worked with diameter limits on any of their collaboratives? Diameter limits on those yet? We haven't quite figured out exactly how big and small to go, what a comfort range is. Um, active management, not just okay, but it's going to be essential. Um, dealing with the mid serial bulge, and what I mean by that is, of course, the, all the medium-sized trees, not referring to Cafe Sabor last night after the mid serial bulge there. Um, but we've got country like this that didn't look that like this way 100 years ago. You know, how do we actually start breaking it up? Um, 
improving watersheds. So looking at this, it's not just restoring or making the fire, or the, the forest more resilient to fire, but the watershed. If this area burns with all these roads out there, that road network is going to just be a constant source of sediment. And so if we can patch those roads up, get them healing now, when the fire does come, it'll, it'll behave much more historically, uh, characteristically. Um, so that's a huge part of it. Road decommissioning, um, it's been interesting where the major conflicts in the past historically have been between the conservation groups and the logging in industry. Here, with these collaboratives, it's not that big a deal. Um, uh, we're actually getting along pretty well. The main source of conflict is with the recreationists. And the reason being, that's my ATV trail. You know, that's where I want to ride my UTV. Don't you dare close it. So that's actually been one of the bigger issues. However, one of the things we've been able to do to help resolve that is use the GRAPE program, the Geographic Road Analysis Inventory Project. And that actually helps tell us which parts of the road are really, really bleeding and dumping that sediment in the stream and which ones aren't. And so they can come back and say, the Forest Service says, actually, it's only this little corner of the road that's causing all the problems. Let's just fix it, we can keep the road. Or they come back and say, oh, the whole roads, it's just we need to relocate it or close it. So, but we're seeing projects like this, and again, this is with the support of the county commissioners to get this work done, and it's, uh, it's really helpful. Addressing illegal OHV use, giving folks a place to go, building partnerships, uh, working with industry, trying to find a value for some of the material, protecting conservation areas. One of the things we're trying to do is uh, exploring some treatments in RCAs. Um, we're not exactly sure how far to go, how much to take. This is where the monitoring hasn't quite fed back into the system yet. We're not sure how, if we're, we're treating enough or not enough. Um, working in the WUI, another huge deal there. Um, and so I'm, I was pleased to see folks talk about the partnerships across boundaries here. Don't, prescribe the, don't forget the prescribed fire. How does it look? Um, and then just a couple tools here. Shameless picture here of my, my girls. Um, but this is Bogus Basin, and uh, a little ski resort. And on this ski resort, uh, there's a bunch of mistletoe and uh, forest health issues. So they're using a categorical exclusion, uh, a kind of a, uh, a faster tracked NEPA, uh, to get the project done. And it's a white hat project in a small scale. Uh, uh, right by the community, and so that's kind of a good example of it. Some of the CE categories we're seeing are outside our comfort zone, but this is one that I think is, is a useful tool for the, some of the collaboratives. Uh, one thing I want to note is that they're supposed to be developed through a collaborative process, but uh, we saw one case where the Forest Service held an open house, and everyone went, walked through and they called it a collaborative, and that doesn't quite work out that well. So it should be, a, you know, if you have a collaborative, use it. Um, good neighbor authority, a new tool. The Forest Service is partnering with the Department of Lands uh, to help uh, uh, increase capacity. So uh, one thing that's great about this is that um, the Department of Lands has embraced this, the Idaho Department of Lands, and they are looking at um, uh, hopefully doubling uh, the Forest Service capacity in the next couple of years. Um, now, there's a little bit of, of l lessons, uh, a little learning curve here, where uh, during the meetings with the Forest Service and Department of Lands, Department of Lands asked, well, can't we just mark the trees first and then do the NEPA? It was like, no, so it's a, we'll see how that goes. We've got to track that. The big benefit, though, is that, uh, anyone here of this little effort in the backyard? Um, the whole success of these forest collaboratives um, has really taken the wind out of the sails of a lot of the, the state takeover folks uh, because they're seeing stuff happen on public lands. The collaboratives give them a voice. Um, the state is involved, increasing partnerships. We're getting more representation there. And um, it's actually been a really nice thing to have folks go, well, you know, I, this is actually working out okay. I'm going to keep, keep, keep working on it. So um, that's been a, a, an interesting thing. We'll see how it goes. So a couple other things, uh, highlights, and then I want to go ahead and wrap up and leave time for questions. Um, so the zone of agreement, what are we trying to accomplish here? Don't forget about that. Review the ground rules, independent facilitator. The independence, even though 
these meetings are often held in a Forest Service office. The Forest Service is invited to the meeting, so having that independence is really helpful. Um, being ready to give and take is huge. Everyone has their own targets and goals. It's good to, be, to understand what everyone's agenda is here. Um, know that everyone can still do, still do their own thing, and, and um, uh, they might still go off and sue or litigate or lobby on this issue, um, but it's nice to have a heads up about it. And then share meals and celebrate successes, something we don't know as much as we should. Um, a couple other things. For groups like Salmon Valley Stewardship, it's nice to have our, our um, community-based uh, um, support. So sharing skills, carpooling, uh, the Forest Service offers video teleconference services, things that help bring folks together, telling your story, letters to the editor, blogs, media tours. Um, it's just nice to get the word out on these things. Um, so a couple of things. We did the conference uh, last year, and there's a couple key takeaways um, or things that are on our to-do list. Now I'm going to skim through these so we have some time. But we're still working on what our restoration objectives are. That's still, stay tuned. Um, the Forest Service has limited capacity, so we need to feel, deal with wildfire funding, CFLRP program, uh, secure rural schools. Um, staff change, the turnover of district ranger staff is really challenging there. Um, we want to go ahead and, and uh, make NEPA work for folks. Um, one thing with NEPA is that um, it's a love-hate relationship, but we want to at least inf help inform the, 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 um, the work we're doing here. So having alternatives has helped collaboratives navigate through this system. Uh, if the Forest Service only does one, the collaborative may get high-centered. Um, and then, last thing I want to mention here, defending your collaborative. Um, we've actually had our collaborative groups go up and file an objection, administrative objection to a project, objecting to any changes to the project. So an outside, quote unquote, force can't come and object to a project and uh, install it or, or shift it away. So it's a placeholder. We've also had folks file an amicus brief. These are the collaboratives on, in support of the Forest Service. Uh, this is with the Tower Salvage on the Panhandle, the Oro Grand on the Nez Clear, the Pioneer on the Boise. And lastly, we've had projects, uh, uh, collaboratives intervene in support of the Forest Service. Um, and so actually, the Forest Service is um, uh, finding these groups are actually stepping up on their, on their behalf. So I'm going to read this because this is from the, the judge who um, was reviewing a request for a temporary restraining order from a... Uh, uh, a conservation group to stop uh, a project the Payette had worked on, the Payette Forest Coalition. And he says, having reviewed the arguments of the parties and the record herein, the court finds the public interest in this case weighs in favor of denying the temporary restraining order. The project's intended purpose in restoring forest conditions, reducing wildfire risks, and improving watershed and wildlife habitat all benefit the public. And those were all because all those interests were in the room developing the project. Additionally, the public has an interest in supporting the collaborative process that was used in this case to develop the project. For these reasons, the court finds the public interest weighs in favor of denying the injunction and the project can proceed. So just one thing I wanted to mention here is that I don't think we necessarily need more tools um, or changing NEPA or, or even the, um, uh, the way ability for folks to, to uh, 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 use the courts on this issue. Um, we're finding that collaboratives have invested so much in these projects that they're stepping up and uh, uh, having a, a forum in front of the Forest Service and the courts to say that, you know, this is a really good project here. We think it should proceed. And, uh, and the court is actually weighing that in favor. The collaborative doesn't preclude NEPA. It's not a replacement for the NEPA process. But um, it is a pretty darn good thing, and it sets a project out in the right foot. So what I want to do is just say that um, open invitation to come up to the collaborative conference uh, up in Idaho this next spring. And, uh, and also, um, it was incredibly helpful to hear that other states and groups and organizations are kind of wrestling with the same issues. And, uh, and so I just want to do an open invitation just to keep the dialogue going and build on successes and where you have challenges, figure out what we can work around with. So with that, I'd be happy to open up for questions.
time for questions, so fire away, John. Yes. Right. No, that's great. Um, uh, the question was, how do you deal with uh, off-highway vehicle uh, user groups who uh, can see often some of the project, the watershed restoration work, as, as a threat, as actually reducing opportunities? Um, and so the answer is to get them at the table, get them in. Uh, and, um, and actually, one of the things that we have done is explicitly added, at least with the Pat Force Coalition, uh, a goal of improving, maintaining or improving recreational opportunities. And so not only they have a seat at the table, but they have a, a, you know, a, a product they're supposed to do. Now, we're going to end up with you know, 90 miles of roads decommissioned. That doesn't sound like a good deal for them. Um, but we're trying to figure out out of those, you know, are there actually some areas where you can actually create a loop opportunity up out of the RCAs? Uh, are there ways where we need a new restroom here? So it's tough. But we've actually found that um, uh, that's where most of the, the conflicts are over the roads and rec. But through a combination of the grape analysis, actually saying what's, what's the science, and actually everyone's agreeing on the science. Uh, and also, um, what are other opportunities? Uh, and, um, and, and the other thing is, when they have folks from the recreation community have a request, like, oh, we want a new uh, um, submitted a grant to Parks and Rec for some trail maintenance here, the other members of the collaborative are writing letters of support for those recreation projects. Even if you're not a dirt biker, even if you're a whole wilderness advocate, even if you're a horseman, you're like, hey, that was part of the deal. They want a nice motorcycle loop and it's not maintained. Let's, we'll all sign off on that. So that's one of the ways we're approaching. Now, it doesn't capture everyone, but we're trying to capture uh, 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 that need because they have an important role to, to play. Other questions? Oh, in the back there. Yes. To what extent uh, do you have uh, private landowners uh, involved in the collaboratives? And are there any specific examples where the, the, the private landowner piece has kind of been integrated into the kind of watershed um, We do. Great, great question about how much uh, are the private property owners um, in and around the collaborative involved in this. And they're involved, but um, we actually have homeowners associations that are there present, um, but we haven't seen the tie-in for treatments yet. And so they're, uh, it's not like, oh great, we're gonna go ahead and have this contractor and we'll use the same contractor and same thinning and same, same stuff. That, it's been out of sequence. We do have this Department of Lands uh, at the table as well with their state lands managed for different purposes. But one of the, thing we're, we're, one of the things we haven't really uh, taken advantage of yet is to, to synchronize efforts, to say, OK, we're going to do this and have more of the all hands, all hands approach. The voices, or a lot of the voices are at the, at the room, but um, uh, we actually haven't, the treatments actually haven't flowed uh, across the boundaries as much as they, they, they should or need to. OK, we're going to have to cut it Great. Off there. Thanks so much. Thank you.